Welcome to Bible Believers Fellowship and the ministry of BBFOhio.com in this very special study taught by our own teaching elder, John Albaugh. The message is titled, Why the King James Bible is the Pure Word of God. Brother John is a seasoned and tested believer with many years of Bible study and teaching experience. He is a gospel preacher with a tract ministry designing his own tracts and pamphlets which he and his wonderful wife Jill have distributed all over America and in several foreign countries. And you can find his resources and teaching materials on his personal ministry website, needhope.org. That web address again is needhope.org. This study is presented by Brother John and meant to challenge the listener to consider the King James Bible and the fact that there is no other book no other version of the English Bible, and no other source for divine truth that is infallible and pure. Why settle for corruption when you can have God's oh, pure okay. word? Here's Brother John. Well, thank you for the opportunity of uh, sharing the word of God with you. Um, again, the topic is uh, why the King James Bible is the pure word of God. Um, December 29th of 1975, High Street Baptist Church sent people over to my house to try to lead me to Christ. And I was 21 years old at the time. I had some religious background, been in Methodist Church uh, a part of my life, a baptized Methodist, but I did not know the Lord. And uh, so we went round for round. And it wasn't until they started using scripture that it started to click. Now. Um, at age 21, I was pretty dumb. At that point, and for the last two, three years of my life, at that point, I didn't care whether there was a heaven or a hell. I, I couldn't even, I could, I could care less. And, uh, and they pulled out a scripture verse. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And they said, John, you're a sinner. Now, just to show you how dumb I was, I thought, who am I to argue with God? <laughs> God says I'm a sinner, I must be a sinner, Amen. okay? And so that was the turning point, and from that point it was easy to lead me to the Lord. Amen. So um, I, I thank them, they had a contest going that night, you know, for that week or whatever, the red team and the blue team, and I, I have no clue what team I got suckered into, you know, but uh, they led me to the Lord, and I knew there was a difference happening in my soul, because I wanted to be a famous cartoon comic artist. And I, I've got the stuff at home still. And uh, as I was doing the panels on my comic strip, my character started saying praise the Lord. <laughs> and I knew at that point I couldn't sell it. <laughs> so I put it aside. And um, let's see, uh, the, the funny part was that a few weeks later they came by to visit with me. I went, to the, I went there at least once that I remember. And it was a, a motel at that point instead of the building. And uh, Normally on Thursdays, I was never home. Now imagine this, they came three Thursdays in a row. Three! And I happened to be there each of those times. And uh, they wanted to argue with me that the King James Bible was the Word of God. Well, I hate to tell you this, but I had me my New Living Translation. <laughs> there it was, I, had, I still have it today. <laughs> I'll look at it once in a while for a joke. <laughs> Okay, because <laughs> it is not the Word of God at all. And, uh, but the funny part is, they never opened up the book and compared it to show me that it was not the Word of God. Three wasted Thursdays. Except for the fact that they implanted in my heart that the King James was the Word of God. And my argument to them was, is, if you read your Bible and I read my Bible, we both turn out the same, what's the difference? And um, I thought it was a pretty good argument. Um, I tried getting into their fellowship, all right? So on the last Thursday that they were there, I found out they had a men's group meeting on Saturday. And, uh, and so I asked if I could be part of their group. And uh, at that point, Saturday mornings, they were studying the book of Revelation. And they told me I was too stupid. I was too stupid to understand it, so I, I should not come. Well, I didn't go back at all. 
And uh, I backslid for nine months at that point. And, uh, but in that nine months, uh, probably a few weeks later, it was a Saturday, and I uh, picked up my New Living Translation. <laughs> and I'm, I'm reading that in Matthew chapter 5. And as I'm reading in Matthew chapter 5, I come across this thing, and it says, there's a little doohickey up there, and it's a footnote. And so I'm going down there, and it says older manuscripts or newer manuscripts or whatever. And they had part of the verse in the ma uh, part of the scripture verse in the uh, footnote. And I'm reading that, and the Holy Spirit of God speaks to me, and he says, John, he says either my word is in the text or not in the text, but it's not in the footnote. Yeah. <laughs> and so at that point, I closed out the electric translation, I went to Gold Circle and bought me a King James Bible, Amen. and I've had one ever since. Amen. And I've been satisfied ever since. Amen. It is the greatest book on this planet. Amen. In fact, if you study it out, you'll find out, uh, you'll find out, out of uh, six Bibles uh, around the world, I forget how many, what the number is, but one out of every six printed Bibles on this planet is an authorized King James. Right. One out of six. The other five are divided up into 24,000 languages, or whatever amount there are, big time. There is no other Bible printed today that will ever surpass the King James between now and the time that the Lord comes back. This is his book, and he went ahead and put his stamp on it. And I've studied it. I've studied every time a critic says something, I've studied it, and I've compared it notes, and uh, the translators that God used for the King James has been right 100% every single time. Amen. I don't change a single word. Because if I can change the word, then I'm in charge of the book. Right. And um, this is a tremendous book. And uh, so uh, as far as sharing with you why this is the word of God, um, I prayed before the Lord and I wanted to share something practical with you. Because I can give you all sorts of statistics and just swoosh you over. Okay? But... <laughs> The just shall live by faith. And if we don't teach any faith out of the book tonight, you're just going to have a whole bunch of facts. And according to 1 Corinthians chapter 8, you'll be proud with knowledge. And God does not want us to take this book and go around slapping people in the head with it. Oh, All right? I just present the truth, and then I let the Lord work it out from there. Our, um, uh, we're going to try to do a psalm study out of Psalm 12. That is going to be the context. But before we get into it, there are two scripture verses that we're going to use in contrast. And when you see what the contrast is, it's going to open up Psalm 12 in a fantastic way. Uh, the first verse I'd like you to have you take a look at is Psalm 119, verse 140. And if you don't get anything else tonight, this would be the uh, encapsulated version. Psalm 119, verse 140. It says here, thy word is very pure, therefore thy servant loves it. Can you imagine that? Thy word. When that was written, it says, thy word is very pure. Another word we could use for pure would be holy. But here, it is pure. Thy word is very pure. That means it's 100% God's word. And what happens when you have a book that's 100% God's word? And here's the fruit. Therefore, thy servant loves it. Amen. There's a love out of the pure word of God that gets transferred into the heart of the believer. You don't have to force it. You don't have to, uh, uh, to use forms of legalism. Uh, Jill and I was in a church <clears throat> that started you using all sorts of tricks to get you to love the book, and, and to be a servant. And look what the verse says here. Thy word is very pure, therefore thy servant. This book will make you a servant. Yeah. And you're going to be a servant with love. And, and nothing's going to stop you. You can't help. You're going to have a bad case. You can't help it. <laughs> I love the Lord. I want to serve him. Yeah. And he puts that in his heart through the book. That is, that's really it in the whole nutshell. Um, but I think on this verse here, we need to have a little understanding on the word love. And uh, I've got way too many scripture verses to have you 
flipping them back and forth and back and forth, but if you need them, I'll share with you later. In 1 John 4, 8, it tells us right off the bat, God is love. There you go, flat out, God is love. So if we got that one nailed down, and this book produces love, then we have a match. We have a match for it. Something I thought was fascinating, if you take a look at uh, John 3, 16, here's God the Father, and what does he do? For God so loved the world, so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son. So now we have God the Father showing love to this world. Now if we take a look at John 13, verses 34 and 35. Um, I am not going to quote everything from memory because I, I want to be an impure Bible before you. <laughs> and we just can't have that. In John chapter 13, 34, and 35. A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one to another. So first and foremost, we shared with you that God is love. We shared with you that God the Father is love, and he proved it by sending us his Son. And then on top of that, we have God the Son saying, to love one another as I have loved you. Now, I would say obviously from 38 years' experience in the Christian life, we don't know the Lord. We're too busy fighting each other over doctrine, fighting over opinion, fighting over philosophies, and this world is, is just as awful as ever. I was in Pastor Frank's office a couple months ago, and he was throwing out a facsimile copy of John R. Rice's first newspaper, uh, Sword of the Lord, from 1934. And I looked at all the headlines there, and I said to him, it looks like we're not making any progress. A divorce, gambling, alcohol was all in the headlines. I, we're not making any progress whatsoever. And yet, we have a book that can make a progress. Amen. It can. When Billy Sunday used to preach against alcohol, nearly every bar would close up when he was done preaching. They would have to close the bars because they didn't have any patrons. In um, 1912, Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, a still mill there, Bethlehem still, the unsaved manager of that plant wrote a letter to the newspaper three months after Billy Sunday had left. And he said, look here, that guy can come to my town anytime. Because without increasing the workers, or increasing the workload, the guy's profits doubled. Because the men came to work sober, marriages were restored, and they were happy. They were singing about the Lord. Amen. That is the power of the gospel of Christ. We'd also like to take a look at Romans chapter 5. I really, the um, first five verses, but time-wise, we'll just go with the last verse. Uh, Romans is a uh, great book. Amen. But uh, some of these verses I'm sharing with you, I just got on my own Bible study. And uh, I noticed in verse 5, And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is set abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. If you're saved tonight and you have the indwelling of the God Spirit, he's going to, the love of God is going to come out. He sheds the love of God in the heart. So we have the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit sharing the love of God. I mean, God is love. That is tremendous. There's uh, something the Lord shared with me this uh, past year. In Matthew 22, Verses 36 through 40, a lawyer comes up, and this lawyer is asking Christ, what's the great commandment? What is the great commandment? Now, almost 38 years ago when I got saved, I got grounded into a church, and uh, I went up to the pastor, and the guy was like the acting pastor. And uh, I was dumber than a stack of bricks. Just hate to tell you, I knew nothing, and I asked both of these guys, I said, can you explain to me these two verses? To love God and to love one another. And to this day, I, I, I can't get the memory out of my heart. They laughed at me. Two guys in spiritual authority laughing 
And they didn't say a single word after that. They just laughed and moved on. Okay? So I've used that as a, um, a thing. When somebody comes to me and asks me questions, I, I, by the grace and mercy of God, I, I, don't, I try not to laugh at them at all. Because I was there at one point. And uh, the stuff I want to share with you here, it says the, the two greatest commandments, uh, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. Uh, Will we have a heart that is free from sin? The heart that's free from sin is going to automatically love God. You're going, to, you're going to have a bad case that can't help it. And when that heart is free from sin, you're going to love your brothers in Christ, your sisters in Christ. It's just automatic. It's, it's just going to flow through you. Will we have sin in our heart? We don't like everybody. And we're definitely not going to share any love with them because we think they deserve the judgment of God on them. That's just the way it works. But uh, when we're free from sin, uh, 1 John, I think, 4.19 says, We love him. Why? Because he first loved us. There's love from him being transferred to me, and I'm taking that love, and I'm sending it right back to him because I've got a heart that's free from sin. The, um, in Romans 5, we read verse 5, but the verse chapter starts off, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Justified by faith. And where does faith come from? Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. Yes. That's it right there. Long time ago, there was a guy called Dale Moody. And he was a young believer in the Lord. And he struggled with faith. He struggled big time. In fact, when he first got saved, he couldn't even explain to the church why he was saved. And so they had to assign a deacon to him. And the deacon worked with the guy for a whole year. And at the end of the whole year, Dale Moody was able to go back to the board and show that he understood what salvation was all about. And so when he became evangelist, he, he struggled with faith. And so he struggled so hard with faith, he cried out to the Lord in his devotion. He cried out to the Lord and said, Lord, look here, I just, I don't get it. I need your help. Show me where I can have an anchor on faith. And he was reading Romans 10 for his devotion that day. And when he got to verse 17, so that faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, the light clicked. The light went on. He never had a problem with faith from that day forward because he understood here's all the faith he needed right here. We don't need anything else added to this book. It's all here. This book, I've studied it for 38 years. It covers every single subject that you'll ever want to cover. Uh, this book knows everything that's going on. It knows what's going on today. It's know what, it knows exactly what's going on tomorrow. Amen. This book is prepared. It knows what's going on. Amen. And if we'll get in the book, we can be prepared. It is a great book. Now, something I thought was fascinating out of Acts 15. 15.9. This is one of those verses I, I read along and the Holy Spirit turns the light on and I stop and I meditate on it. And uh, I think Peter's doing the talking here, and in verse 9 he says, And put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Again, why is this book the Word of God, the true Word of God, the pure Word of God? Because when you get into it, it'll purify your heart. Amen. It'll purify it from top to bottom. Amen. This book has a purifying power. We'll get in the book, and we'll read that book. The... Um, and you already know uh, the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, verse 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. When you have that pure heart, you can see God, and you can see what he's doing, and you can line up with him. And as simple as that. A lot of times, why well, we don't line up with him, because we can't see him. And so we'll invent a philosophy, or we'll invent something new. And we won't go any further than that. But blessed are the pure in hearts, for they shall see God. And, um, and of course, w one other thing in here, Galatians 5, 22, 23. The very first fruit of the Spirit is love. <laughs> very first fruit. And down through my years, I've heard so, so many preachers and teachers knock the doctrine of love. Mm -hmm. And they don't understand it. Love is not only just a four-letter word. There is at least seven 
major principles dealing with it. And once you find out what the seven are, then one of the things is God says, as, as many as I love, I rebuke. Mm -hmm. So if those who like to <laughs> rebuke, there it is. It's not just a flimsy thing. Oh, love, well, I'll just let you go. You can do whatever you want. No, when there's genuine love, there'll also be genuine rebuke. And the pur purpose of that rebuke is to draw you back in. Amen. The, um, something else I meditated, too, on the Ten Commandments. Uh, I don't know about you, but most of, most of my life I've always looked at it as legalism because that's the way it's been taught. But once I understood that if my heart becomes free from sin, then the Ten Commandments read different. If I have a heart that's free from sin, thou shalt have no other gods before you. Thee. None. I don't want any other gods before me. I want him because he loved me and he died on the cross for all my sins. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Amen. I have no desire to take his name in vain. <laughs> he's wonderful. He's great. He's fantastic. And you can go th through that whole list and it has a whole new meaning to it. When you're free from sin, it just brings a new life to it. The, uh, the contrast to this has to be Matthew 24, 12. Matthew 24, 12. This is the contrast verse. When I came across this verse, it, I, it just blew me away. I know it's an end time verse. Um, I've got a, a pretty good idea of where it's located at in prophecy and everything else. But let's take a look at the principle behind it. Because the principle behind it is good for any age. Matthew 24, 12. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. We're in that time frame now. The word wax means to grow. It grows cold. Because iniquity shall abound. And so it's very important to understand what iniquity is. And if you have a King James Bible, it's not too hard to figure out where iniquity comes from. It's not hard at all. Uh, in fact, I was having some fun doing some meditating on this. In Ezekiel 28, it deals with Lucifer before he fell. Go to verse 28, uh, chapter, chapter 28, verse 15. Um, what a wild study you could ever have on this. At one point, every single thing in the world, every single thing in the universe, however God had it at that time with, with Lucifer, everything was perfect. Everything. Mm -hmm. Nothing was out of course. Everything was perfect. And then we come to this verse. Thou was perfect in thy ways from the day that thou was created, till iniquity was found in thee. Iniquity. Uh, what, what a word. I've heard it taught a few times where iniquity and sin is the same thing. But I'd like to share with you out of God's word. It, it is similar, but there's uh, the two words are spelled different. Amen. There's something else. <laughs> there's something different about it. You need to check into it. Um, I have come up with a definition that I think satisfies my curiosity when I study scripture. And what I've got here for iniquity being defined. Iniquity, and, there, and there's threefold. When God originally created us, we had spirit, soul, and body. So when you do a study of definitions, keep that in mind because you'll, you'll see something fascinating there. But iniquity is, number one, separation from God's spirit. Now we're going to learn that God's spirit is love. Lucifer, whatever he did, he separated himself from God's spirit. Separation from God's law that deals with the soul. Now we could throw in the word love there, but the word law is fine, or you could throw in the word principles. I found out that uh, another definition for the word Gentiles means without God's law. And it makes sense. For me it makes sense, so it's fine. And uh, iniquity is also the separation of God's design. <laughs> We're there now. Look here, one man, one woman for life. That's what God designed. He did design one man with five wives. Okay? I think the Muslims stop at four. Okay? But that's their design. Um, there's a certain design God has for families. There's a certain design he has for the government. There's a certain design that he has as far as for work.
but he has a design, and it's all recorded right in here, what you're supposed to do at what time you're supposed to do it. And we're watching that design in our lifetime disintegrate, falling apart. That's iniquity. And it says, because iniquity shall abound, the love of money shall wax cold. Uh, my mom and dad separated when I was age 12. And uh, they'll say, well, you know, after 18, you'll, you'll, you'll get over it. Everything will be fine. And I hate to tell you this, when divorce happens, even as being a kid, you never get over it. The impression is still stuck in the soul. It's still stuck. God, in, I think, in Malachi, either chapter 2 or chapter 3, he says he hates divorce, big time. And why does he hate divorce? One of the reasons, it, it destroys the design. Destroys the design. And I found out reading in, and I think it's Proverbs chapter 1, but you find in there, the husband, the husband or the father represents the word of God, and the wife represents faith in the word of God. And when you take the word of God and put faith to it, it produces fruit. And children are called fruit. And for us, the Holy Spirit. What light is that shining so brightly for me?